In today's new video, we're going to be talking about spinal disc nutrition and spinal disc physiology. I'm going to be breaking down things into perspective and getting into a little bit more advanced details about how spinal disc nutrition and physiology can maybe cause problems to our spinal disc and how we may be able to optimize our nutrition to further improve our spinal disc health and maybe prevent injuries such as a disc herniation or disc bulge or annular tear from occurring. Hey, how's it going everybody? Remy Sovereign here from remysovereign.com. With today's new video, we're gonna be diving into spinal disc nutrition and physiology, and we're gonna be touching on some of the more advanced concepts that are associated with good spinal disc health and how problems with regards to the physiology and nutrition can cause problems to the spinal disc, specifically in relation to something like an annular tear or disc bulge or disc herniation occurring. And what I'll be talking about also more towards the end of the video is how you may be able to optimize your nutrition in theory and how that can improve spinal disc nutrition and essentially maintain good spinal disc health in the long run and also maybe help in the recovery from a disc herniation or disc bulge. So the first thing that we need, we're going to be talking about and the first thing we need to identify is the energy systems regarding the spinal disc. So our spinal disc cells primarily rely on anaerobic glycolysis to produce ATP. Now ATP is our universal energy source and essentially it is defined or just known as adenosine triphosphate, which is kind of the name for it. And it's our universal energy source and it's responsible for cell signaling. It's important in many enzymatic reactions, transporting molecules, and without ATP essentially, our spinal disc cells would die, but at the same time, we would die just as our body because ATP is not only important in spinal disc cells, but all other cells throughout the body. So without it, we wouldn't be alive essentially. Now, the point that I want to address now though is now that we have identified anaerobic glycolysis is our primary energy system. So why it's our primary energy system is because it does not require oxygen to produce ATP. So it can produce ATP at a very high rate. And for our spinal discs, it's believed that we need to, be, we need to produce ATP at a very high rate in order to keep up with the demands of the cell. And that could just be in relation or in theory because we have very limited blood supply to the spinal disc cell so it may be so with regards to oxidative phosphorylation if we go through that energy system it takes much longer to kind of produce atp even though we're producing a lot more atp however our spinal disc cells may have just a more rapid requirement or need to produce atp so we have to produce it with regards to anaerobic glycolysis all that being said now Here's what happens and here's kind of my theory of what's occurring and what a lot of the research kind of suggests or states. So when we have problems with regards to our spinal disc cells and we go through anaerobic glycolysis. So if we produce a, so, so firstly, the end product kind of glycolysis is lactate. So here's where the problems may occur at the, with the end product of lactate here. Now, the end product lactate, as we produce it, and as we have that high demand for energy for our spinal disc cells, if we can't eliminate that lactate from the cell, that lactate's gonna build up inside the cell. And so what ends up happening with regards to that lactate building up is if we can't remove it, because maybe some sort of proteins may be denatured, decoded, or they just can't keep up with the demand at which that cell is producing lactate for whatever reason. Now that lactate can go back through glycolysis. So it can go back the process because glycolysis is reversible up until we get to phosphofructokinase. We get up to that enzyme at phosphofructokinase, which that is an irreversible step or reaction. Now, the problem here so is lactate will go back into pyruvate via lactate dehydrogenase. Pyruvate will then go back up through glycolysis. So we go pyruvate into phosphenopyruvate, pyruvate kinase. So pyruvate kinase, there's your second step in glycolysis that you're producing ATP. So there's two steps that you produce ATP, pyruvate kinase being one of them. And the point being though that I just want to kind of address is that as you keep, go you keep going up the chain now because these molecules keep accumulating. So it's almost a compensation because we can't remove that lactate. So now that we can't remove that lactate as a compensation, now we, it, lactate's gonna go back into pyruvate. We build up the pyruvate. Now, we go, now that we built up all this pyruvate, we go back into phosphenopyruvate, and we build up all this phosphenopyruvate, and we keep going up the chain. But at that step there, pyruvate kinase, there's one step where you're producing ATP, but you just keep going up the chain, and essentially, once we get to that phosphofructokinase reaction there, it's an irreversible reaction, so we can't go backwards now. And so we get stuck at that step, just prior to that step, we get stuck there, 
And essentially, once we get stuck there, we're not going to be producing any ATP now. And so when it's a popping, we're not producing ATP, we might get cell death because of that process and the cell just may die because now we can't meet up with the energy demands or requirements because we're not producing ATP via anaerobic glycolysis. Another thing that could happen now is with regard to the lactate accumulating, we could also have, when we, so when we generate lactate, we may also get, we also get hydrogen ions accumulating or lactic acid. Essentially lactic acid is just lactate with the hydrogen ion together. But regardless, so lactic acid being acidic, if we generate all that lactic acid in the cell, we get a drop in pH. pH drops, if it significantly drops, we may get cell death because once our pH drops, a lot of the enzymes start kind of altering in terms of their functions. Some may op be better optimized, some may be not better optimized. They actually may be worse and they may actually die because they can't work at that optimal pH. So if pH drops too low, we may get, we may get cell death. And so that's just a result of us not being able to remove that hydrogen ion or the lactic acid from the cell because we may not have those protein transporters. Now I must say, I, I'm, this is just stuff I'm learning. I'm still learning and I've been kind of doing a lot of the research, at least reading a lot of research in the past few months. I'm more familiar with muscle physiology. So that's kind of where my experience is more kind of so, where my familiarity is. But there's obviously a lot of overlap to spinal discs cells as well. And that's kind of anaerobic glycolysis being the same. But the tr protein transporter that may be kind of not working properly, maybe the monocarboxylate transporter 4, which I believe is the same in spinal disc cells. Don't quote me on that. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but from what I read and believe, it's, it would be the same as muscle cells just because muscle cells, in muscle cells, we remove lactate via the monocarboxylate transporter 4. So I would assume it's the same. I haven't specifically gone through all the research. Um, and there's a lot of, it's, the research is really limited, but I believe it's the same. But if it is the same, or regardless, if it isn't the same, there's still a protein transporter that needs to remove that lactate. So monocarboxylate transporter four is what removes lactate in muscle cells, but and maybe the same as spinal disc cells. So if that's kind of not working properly, we may not be able to remove that lactate. And so that's why we get that whole buildup and we may get that drop in pH if we aren't able to maybe remove those hydrogen ions or lactic acid. And that could drop that pH, cause cell death, or we could have that whole just process where we're going back through, through glycolysis because of that buildup and it's acting kind of as a compensation to go back through. And eventually we wouldn't produce ATP. So we get, so we get ultimately the big picture, spinal disc cells are dying. And when our spinal disc cells die, and that's how essentially we get deterioration or we get damage in a spinal disc. And that's how something maybe like an annular tear or something like a herniation or bulge may occur over time if we get enough cells dying off. So. That's just kind of what I want to touch on the physiology there now. But also, it's also important to mention that aerobic metabolism, so we've looked at electron transportane, Krebs cycle, those are very important in producing energy within the spinal disc as well. So optimizing those would be important too. But the whole kind of the picture here is now is that one needs to efficiently optimize, if one were to efficiently optimize anaerobic glycolysis or aerobic metabolism, and that would be by consuming, you know, the proper vitamins and minerals to support those reactions. So a good example would be vitamin B3, which essentially acts as a precursor to, or a precursor or coenzyme to one of the reactions in anaerobic glycolysis. And so if we don't have vitamin B3 or if we're deficient in it, we may not be able to effectively optimize or produce energy when we go through the system. Now this is just an, isn't just for a spinal disc, this could be for muscle cells as well or other kind of cells in the body uh, with regards to anaerobic glycolysis. But then we, get into the, we can get into the Krebs cycle, which we know vitamin B1, vitamin two, B2, vitamin B3. We need, to, we need to have an efficient or sufficient amount of those to effectively optimize and go through the same thing with iron, magnesium, manganese. Magnesium being really important just because it's essentially it puts ATP or magnesium is needed with regards to ATP, to make ATP in its active form. So magnesium really important, but then we get into something like vitamin C, we can talk about reactive oxygen species, those can also play a role in causing spinal discs cell death and vitamin C acting as an antioxidant. So get into, that's kind of getting into more of the electron transport chain now, which is just another energy system, or essentially another system that produces ATP. 
And so that's why I made a previous video where I talked about superoxide dismutase and alpha lipoic acid, and essentially those being antioxidants. Those can be beneficial, maybe preventing those ROS or reactive oxygen species from, from forming, specifically that uh, superoxide an anion from forming. So that's just kind of what I wanted to touch on, guys. Just, I kind of wanted to open it up. And the important thing, the important takeaway, I think, from this is that when we're talking about nutrition, well, it's good to look at, oh, you're on a high calorie diet or low calorie diet, you know, high carb diet, low fat diet. You need to, it needs to be kind of broken into more detail. And well, that's, I'm not saying that's not important or not. What's more, what we need to kind of more talk about is, are you deficient in this nutrient? Are you deficient in vitamin A, vitamin C? vitamin B12, B6, B9, B1, whatever the case may be. Because if you're deficient in those nutrients, you, based on what nutrient it is, you may not be able to sufficiently move through glycolysis, move through Krebs cycle, or produce energy via electron transport chain. And so therefore, it's important to kind of make sure you're consuming an optimal diet and you're kind of meeting your nutrient requirements on a daily basis in order to effectively optimize those. Because if we were able to effectively optimize those, we can effectively produce ATP and kind of move through the system and just move through the system more efficiently. And that's just not spinal discs, that's also other cells in the body as well. But I know a lot of my audience out there and a lot of people watching this video are watching this specifically for spinal disc health. And so I just wanted to kind of make that video for the purpose of that. So kind of look to the various vitamins, look to the various minerals. Are you a fish? Are you taking or consuming enough? Are you deficient in this? Look to that because that may be a good indication of where you may need to improve. Now, with that being said though, nutrition, physiology is a very, very complex, complicated and complicated concept. I am no expert on it. I'm, I would consider myself maybe educated and knowledgeable on some areas, but I am no expert. And the reason being is because there are so many factors to consider when talking about nutrition and physiology. So number one would be, what are you consuming? So let, uh, what, are you, what types of foods are you consuming and are you consuming them with certain supplements? So for example, are you consuming vitamin B9 with maybe some sort of food? The reason being is because now whatever that food is, it could maybe alter the absorption of that vitamin in the body. It could maybe prolong the absorption. Maybe it, it could speed up the absorption or whatnot. Uh, or at the same time, what type of you know, magnesium are you taking? Is magnesium citrate, magnesium oxide? Because all these kind of different types of substances all have, all have different effects on the body and they all have different purposes. And I honestly, that's way over my pay grade. I do not know, that's why I don't talk about it, but just to kind of educate you guys, give you guys more perspective. But at the same time, we can go into more detail is the transportation of those molecules getting into the spinal disc cell. So how do they move to there and transport to there? So obviously we talk about through the blood vessels, now, is there problems with regards to the blood vessels? Is there problems with regards to maybe some of the ion transport? Or is there some sort of cal calcification on the end plates, which maybe close some of the pores and pre will prevent transport of molecules into the spinal disc cell? At the same time, like I mentioned, the removal of the lactate. Now, going back to kind of those protein transporters, if there's a problem with those protein, now, there may not be a problem with those protein transporters. We may have a sufficient amount where it could remove the lactate from the spinal disc, but the problem may now be is we, we aren't able to remove the lactate from maybe the spinal disc itself. So there's those pores that may be closed off and, it can, and the lactate is just kind of forced to stay inside the spinal disc, whether that's maybe in the extracellular matrix or just outside of the cell, or just to kind of mention on that and kind of give you guys a different perspective to look at things. Point being guys, nutrition, physiology, very complex. And my kind of just suggestion recommendation is look to your dietary kind of nutrients. Are you getting sufficient amount on a daily basis, because if you are, or if you aren't, this may be causing or be causing problems with your recovery. But if you were to optimize them, that could maybe help in the recovery in theory in the long run, or just help kind of maintain good healthy spinal discs in the long run. But not just kind of spinal discs, just your overall health with regards to other cells in your body as well. And so, actually, a good app for this, guys, uh, is Super Tracker. It's a Super Tracker online uh, nutrition application. I actually like the app, it's, it's free, and it gives you a very detailed dietary nutri nutrient breakdown of what you, may be cons what you may be kind of missing out on, or what you're sufficient in, or maybe over consuming. It's a good app to check out if you're looking to kind of maybe improve nutrition and looking for something that can give you a detailed breakdown kind of just for free, and it's a, it's a pretty good quality app. 
without kind of maybe going to see a, you know, a nutritionist or dietitian. But with that being said, guys, that's what I wanted to kind of touch on with regards to the spinal dysphysiology and nutrition. I am no expert, but I just wanted to kind of break down some things and put things kind of in perspective to, of to how nutrition would look like. At the end of the day, everyone's program is going to be individualized and needs to be different. And that's just kind of what I wanted to kind of educate you guys on and kind of talk to you guys about and share with you. And hopefully this video helped you guys. And if actually you're someone that maybe has found an improvement via taking certain supplements or maybe consuming a certain diet and have noticed benefits in terms of maybe reducing pain, maybe helping in your recovery from a herniated disc, or maybe just helping with your overall health and performance. I would love to hear about that, guys. I'd love for you to share with me with that. And for that, guys, I wish you guys all the best and a successful and productive day, and take care.